Hello and welcome to the Wisdom T20 World Cup daily podcast. New Zealand have put some distance between themselves and the rest of Group 1 with a commanding win over Sri Lanka. It wasn't all plain sailing for the Black Caps, so they were 15 for three early doors before Glenn Phillips' sensational 100 took them to 167, a total they comfortably defended. I'm Yaz Rana and talking through the game today with me is Wisdom.com staff writer Katia Whitney and Wisdom India head of content Abhishek Mukherjee. Um, Sri Lanka got off to a brilliant start, reducing New Zealand to 15 for three. And at that point, you were really wondering, can New Zealand even get to 140? They sailed past there for two main reasons. One, Glenn Phillips, and two, Sri Lanka's abysmal fielding. Abhishek, it was an amazing 100. He consolidated early with Daryl Mitchell before exploding in the second half of that innings. Tell us a bit about Phillips. He's had a brilliant year in bilateral cricket. He's 25 years old. How good is he? Uh, I think, uh, let's see, I'll give you uh, some numbers. I think uh, Phillips has uh, 1,210 runs, I just checked. So, of all active cricketers with more runs than Phillips, only even Lewis and Glenn Maxwell have a better strike rate. And no one in the world has a better average. Mm. So, if you put those two restric- restrictions, then uh, essentially... Uh, no one has a has more runs and more, a better average and a better strike rate than Phillips. So that is how good he is. This has been a fantastic year. He uh, he has been um, striking at a, a very good rate in excess of 150. One may say that New Zealand did not. Uh, some of New Zealand's matches were against the weaker teams, but he also uh, struck at one for one over 150 for Auckland. He had a, a slightly low year for Gloucestershire, but he has generally done well in T20 cricket. And uh, I think, it, I, I mean, I'm surprised that uh, he has not got a longer run in the IPL. Hmm. He's, he's kind of gone under the radar then uh, for some yeah. of the days yeah. to have done so well. What, why is it that people haven't talked to him as much? Is it basically because he's not had a proper run in the IPL, do you think? Because it, sorry, uh, sorry, the reason why I ask is because his, his record for New Zealand this year, particularly number four, is really, really good. Um, he is, he's averaging over 50, a strike rate of around about 150 in a role that very few people nail. That is number four. So, so as, as you saw today, you have to be quite adaptable to do well at number four. Yeah, and uh, the, the thing is, he has done well whenever he has got a, uh, virtually whenever he has got a chance. So in this, uh, and he can adapt in uh, the tri-series against Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, New Zealand got off to, uh, New Zealand needed him to strike. Uh, they needed him to bat quickly again the Bangladesh matches and he did that. New Zealand, uh, 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 things were not that great against Pakistan, so he slowed down for a bit. So he can adapt. And in the series against West Indies, uh, I, I think he, scored, he was fantastic in all three matches. Not really sure why he doesn't get the uh, recognition he deserves, but uh, yeah, I, I I hope he gets a proper run in every major tournament in the world. Mm. Um, Katia, he's quite fun as well. Um, at one point, he missed a slower ball that bounced more than he expected, and he almost gestured to the pitch to take the pitch outside for a one-on-one in the car park. And his um, adoption of the sprinter's crouch at the non-striker's end was great too. Uh, he's just a very entertaining cricketer, brilliant in the field as well. Yeah, he's really fun to watch, isn't he? Um, I think Kane Williamson said in, in the interview afterwards the pitch was quite tennis ball-y, so maybe maybe that's what he's um, expressing his frustration with. But I particularly liked the getting out of the blocks in the in the non-strikers um, end. That was really, really good. Um, finding a solution to the man-cad that we're all craving, I think. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that more players don't do it. I know that... Um, it's a safe way. There's no there's no danger of getting man cadded. Um, and there's one quick single in particular. I can't remember who's on strike, but someone basically didn't get it off the square and Phillips was down the other end in no time. It seems like a very obvious thing to do if players are kind of switched on. I, think, I guess batters are just so used to switching off when they're at the non-striker's end. Um, but Phillips is someone who's just clearly, as you see in the field as well, he's just 100% on it um, mm. all the time. The um, one drawback of that is, uh, what if the batter hits the ball back to the fielder? If you're that much committed to the run, then probably you're gone. But yeah, that is, in the last over, that's probably a risk worth taking. Mm. 
Maybe we should start getting specialist non-striker coaches into the game. Maybe that'll take <laughs> with it. Um, Abhishek, what do you make of Sri Lanka's approach to the ball? They bowled so many slower balls. Sometimes it was effective, sometimes not. Was that the way to go when they had New Zealand three down early on? And they, they also held back two of Tikshana's overs right back to the end. He needs one of their more threatening bowlers. See, uh, on the same pitch, Australia uh, did, did not try to do that. They used their paces uh, first up. And they and New Zealand came at them. That was what prompted New Zealand, Sri Lanka to take the pace off the ball. It worked for a while. I mean, uh, after ten overs, I think New Zealand were fifty-four, but uh, Sri Lanka conceded twenty-one runs the, just because of poor fielding, and, and that is very that, that is an unusually high number for a single match. And mm. once you do that, no amount of good bowling can help. You. Mm. Katia, as Abhishek says, Sri Lanka were really, really bad in the field. Yeah, really, really bad. It was mainly the drop of Glenn Phillips, to be honest. I think Nisanka dropped him. That was an absolute sitter. And you can see the game turn in that moment because if that had been taken, they've got Sri Lanka, uh, they've got New Zealand 30 for four with Daryl Mitchell coming in off back off an injury, not having played much cricket, Nisham in at the other end, and then a really long tail to follow. You can easily see how the game would have turned out completely differently if that catch had been taken. Because at the end of the day, they didn't bat well enough to chase down the runs, whatever runs they conceded, but that wicket really, really was the key. Um, so you can almost put it down to that one crucial moment in the field. Um, and so much is made of fielding, as that being the difference between the best sides and good sides. It's not so much in T20 because of the amount of chances batsmen or batters do give. Um, but in that case, it was really, really important. I mean, you can't drop someone who goes on to get 100 on 20. And then there was another drop as well, not as bad, but you just you just don't drop them. And the Sanka really should have taken it. Mm. And, and generally quite sloppy. There were a few no balls as well. And, and that 21-1 figure, that completely changes the game. Uh, Lang- Lang- uh, New Zealand would have otherwise have, have put quite a manageable target in, in 145-ish at, at the fielding, even been par, not even been good par according to Crick Biz. And also I felt that New Zealand and Phillips in particular sensed that Sri Lanka were having a really bad day in the field. So it was calling for twos really, really early, putting more and more pressure onto the Sri Lanka fielders. Um, and then with the ball, New Zealand were right on it again, very similar to the Australia game last week. It's a very balanced attack, a left arm quick, a kind of swing bowler in Southie, a leg spinner, a very good left arm spinner in Santana, and then express pace with Lockie Ferguson. They had Sri Lanka 8 for 4 before eventually bowling them out for 102. Katia, Tim Southey and Trent Bolt, so good in World Cup cricket again and again and again. They are so good. Like, I think we have to, they come into tournaments and everyone's like, Tim Southey, Trent Bolt, yeah, they're really good. No, no, they are really good. Like, they're properly, properly good. And they're certainly the most experienced new ball partnership in the World Cup. They've been playing for such a long time. And I think that kind of sums up the New Zealand side. They're quite experienced. Um, and every World Cup, they come in and we say, this will be the year that their approach to white ball cricket is, is undone. And, and this will be the year they don't do it. And they surprise us every single time. And I think a lot of that is down to Bolt and Southie. Like of all the new ball partnerships in the World Cup, they, they have more than 50 wickets between them. Um, and Bolt's economy rate is less than six in World Cups, which for a seam bowler it is quite staggering. Um, and it's only Nokia um, who has, in this World Cup, who has a better economy as pace bowler than Bolt does. Um, and Southie's obviously now the leading wicket taker in T20s. We saw that happen today. Um, and to have one bowler like that is fantastic. But New Zealand have a pair of them operating in tandem from either end. I mean, we saw uh, Southie start today with a wicket maiden and Bolt follow that up as well. Um, and if you're ranking new ball attacks in this tournament, New Zealand's have got to be up there, if not the best. I mean, you can talk about India or, or South Africa or Australia with, with Stark, but it, it's because they have the two of them together that it, that makes them so good. Uh, and it's quite nice to see, actually, because neither of them are express pace. You know, they don't come in with that kind of big fanfare, but they just do what they do, operating from either end. And they're really good, left arm, right arm. And we need to enjoy them because we're not going to see them for much longer at T20's World Cup. So we should celebrate them while they last. Mm, absolutely. And the other thing, uh, uh, she mentioned fanfare. I remember uh, six years ago in India, when the T20 World Cup was held in India, New Zealand left both of them out because the pitch would not have assisted them. And there was no, there was no, I, I mean, had this been in some other country, several other countries, the continent countries, or some other country that would have 
there would have been a massive outburst, outrage in over leaving out both superstar faces. But it was nothing. It was, they just went with the conditions. So I think that is that. Uh, I mean, New Zealand's ability to uh, they, I mean, not care about the stardom is probably one of the factors that contribute to their consistent success. Mm. Abhijit, they they don't um, in T Twenty cricket. They're not they're not appreciated, I guess, in the same way as they are in Test cricket. Everyone knows how good they are in Test cricket. In T Twenty cricket, they're not players who you necessarily associate with as being like IPL bankers teams that will, uh, players who get picked up in every single auction uh, and will play every single game for a franchise. Um, what what is it you know with with that with Shaheen not being one hundred percent fit, Archer not being in the World Cup. Uh, Boomer not being in the World Cup. There's a reasonable case, as Cathy says, for them to be the best new ball pairing, at least, at this World Cup. Um, what is it about them that means that they don't quite get that fanfare that we're talking about in T20 cricket? I don't know. I mean, uh, it is very difficult. And I mean, I, I see New Zealand as a very good T20 side, but uh, maybe it's the conditions in the IPL. Maybe... Uh, I, I, I don't... I have no clear answer to this because I personally feel that uh, the IPL should feature more New Zealand cricketers. Ben Phillips, he played just three matches. Yes, he has just three matches. And Martin Guptill has, I mean, uh, he is not the same batter he used to be uh, in T20 cricket, but uh, when he was at his peak, even then he went, uh, he was ignored season after season. And so everyone has now played three games in Group 1. New Zealand are top on five points and the rest are all squeezed in on either two or three points. England are currently second with a superior net run rate to Ireland and Australia. Katia, who do you think, with two games to go for each side, who do you think the two teams are going to be that go to semi-finals? Well, New Zealand are in the box seat because they had that massive win over Australia and they've got a ridiculous net run rate. So you've got to say they're in the box seat. Um, and then you've probably got to look between Australia and England and, and that England game against New Zealand on Tuesday is going to be really, really big, particularly for England. Um, so you've got to assume that Australia will beat both Ireland and Afghanistan, putting them on the seven points. And you'd also expect England to beat Sri Lanka and probably New Zealand to beat Ireland. Um, so that would make New Zealand on seven, Australia on seven and England on five. Um, and if England then beat New Zealand, you'll have all three teams on seven with New Zealand probably at the top on net run rate. And then it will be down to the, um, the the win margins for Australia and England to see who goes through in second place. So it's massively wide open. Um, as we've said with this World Cup, it's just throwing up so many surprises that so many teams could qualify for the semifinals. Um, but I think New Zealand will probably beat England, um, meaning there will be Australia and New Zealand through theoretically to the semi-finals but who knows you know who knows something could come up again that throws us all don't forget the rain um yeah. you, how, okay. how, how do you see it uh, i uh, there are a few things for example uh first of all england versus uh sri lanka so that is uh, england may be favorites there but it may not be uh england have won the last seven matches against sri lanka but uh Sri Lanka have this odd habit of uh, uh, winning matches when no one expects them. And then uh, Australia's last match will be against Afghanistan, so which is essentially playing Rashid Khan in Adelaide, uh, essentially his home ground. So that is probably not going to be... I mean, uh, it, uh, it may come across as a match where Australia can come, make up for the net run rate, but, it, but Rashid Khan won't make it easy for them. This is his ground more than any, perhaps more than more, most Australians. This is his ground. It, it all hinges on that England New Zealand match. But uh, yeah, if England can get past that, they have that one advantage of playing the last match. So if uh, uh, Australia and England are on the same points, and uh, I mean, Australia are two points ahead, and England have to win this, win the last match uh, for two. Uh, Draw level with level level on points. They will also know how many to score, so they will always have that advantage. Mm. Yeah, I, I think if there's no rain, which is a massive if, I probably think England will get there. Yes. I think England will beat 
New Zealand. Mm. Much more of an optimist than I am then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do I do still think England are a very good side that had a bad day against Ireland. And I think that actually that defeat will um, get them to, to refocus in a, in a healthy way. Um, but if the rain does continue to intervene, you can't really write off Ireland. I mean, that Australia-Ireland game, if that, if that gets rained off, you could definitely see, see Ireland beating uh, New Zealand at Adelaide on, on November 4th. And that would leave Ireland on six points. And if there's rain around, six points could be enough to get through. You never know. It's a bit like the other group with how Zimbabwe's rained off game against South Africa proved massively beneficial for them. So it's all to play for at the moment with two rounds to go. Um, thanks for your time, Katia. Thanks for your time, Abhishek. That is all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow for another triple game day in Group 2. Bangladesh plays Zimbabwe in a massive game at the Gabba first up. Pakistan take on the Netherlands, both sides still looking for their first win of the Super 12s. And then India take on South Africa in the top of the table clash in the, in the night game at Perth.